want to welcome you to the fourth in our series of Institute Encounters. Uh, our guest today is Dr. Ian Morris, who is the Jean and Rebecca Willard Professor of Classics and History at Stanford University. Uh, the author of a variety of works, but that most particularly uh, and recently, uh, Why the West Rules for Now, which is a study and analysis of world history uh, indicating the general trend lines of human development and making a very interesting and provocative argument about why it was the West rather than some other great center of civilization that achieved the spectacular breakthrough into modern technological modernity that occurred in the last 200 years and hence came to rule, so to speak, the world, at least for now. So, uh, your argument, and of course we, we, we heard a little of the argument, we heard a lot of the argument actually, <laughs> <laughs> yesterday uh, during your, your lecture. Uh, your argument uh, is essentially a materialist argument and a materialist argument of a particular type, one which stresses the opportunities offered to various cultures by geographic location. And geographic location can mean a variety of things. Maybe you could describe the types of variables that are encompassed by the, the notion of a sort of a favorable geographic location. Yeah, well, one of the big surprises I got while I was writing the book was the role of geography in the story, which I had not entirely foreseen when I began writing the book. It became clear as I, I worked my way through this story. And um, what I felt I'd learned by the time I finished writing the book was that geography had been the most important force in um, determining social development and that you, what, what sort of development, what rates of development different groups of people would see. But the reason the historical story is so complicated is that while on the one hand geography determines the development of society, the development of the society also determines what the geography means. And so that as societies change, different kinds of things become geographically important. And so if you go back 15,000 years to the end of the last ice age, that the world is warming up, it, it turns out that a particular kind of geography is very favorable for societies becoming more complex, bigger, more developed. And that is uh, the kind of geography you find in a band of latitudes that in the old world runs roughly from China to the Mediterranean. And within that area, in several places, plants and animals evolved that humans are able to interact with and domesticate these plants and animals. So rice, wheat, barley, uh, goats, pigs, sheep, cattle, and um, domesticate these animals and become farmers. And so at that point, that sort of geography is the most important thing in the world. But as these societies get bigger and more complex, it turns out they need something else, which is access to great rivers. And so there's a few areas where they get access to these great rivers, where farming societies are able to expand much faster still, turn into cities, states, empires. As that happens, um, the meanings of geography shift again, and now access to a great sea, like the Mediterranean Sea, that becomes the most valuable thing. More time goes on, you know, more, more stuff happens, lots, lots keeps happening and changing. Um, eventually, by about five, six hundred years ago, developments reached the point that uh, humans can master entire oceans. And the Atlantic Ocean, being smaller than the Pacific Ocean, of course, this is the great ocean that humans first master. Europeans are able to draw the Americas into a European-dominated economy. Geography changes its meaning. Europeans have an industrial revolution and, and go on in the last 200 years, as you're saying, to really dominate the planet. It. But um, the, the other big takeaway I felt I had got in writing this book was grasping what I think you know, we, we all in a certain level get, but you don't always think about it, that the story hasn't ended. And we have this tendency to think history leads to us and stops. It doesn't. Uh, the story is carrying on, geography is continuing to shift, and that's why there's the for now bit in the title, uh, because the advan geographical advantages that put the West on top are, are changing. I mean, even as we speak, uh, the, the centers of power and wealth are shifting toward East Asia. So the initial advantage in terms of the breakthrough into agriculture uh, seems to me, from what you're saying, to be resource endowment. Mm -hmm. You have a variety of plants and animals on the scene that can be domesticated. 
Uh, and then the succeeding geographical advantages, being in a great river valley, uh, I guess partly a matter of um, the sheer amount of productivity you can get from an irrigated river mm -hmm. valley, and so support for large social structures, and maybe partly communication, so yes. you can hold yes. a large social structure together. And then at the next level, uh, maybe at the next two levels, uh, it, though taking baby steps and then moving to giant steps, uh, in the case of the West with the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean is fundamentally a communication system. That, would that be yes, correct? Yes, well, again, I think uh, it, the, these things tend to go together. So it's, it's a communication system, but it's also a kind of resource multiplier. And then the great plus of the Mediterranean basin in ancient times is the ability to move large amounts of goods cheaply over long distances. And people get better and better at this as the first millennium BC um, goes on. And uh, there's a, a famous calculation that was made some years ago from Roman inscriptions that I think it costs roughly the same amount to move a boatload of grain from Egypt to the city of Rome by sea as it then cost to unload the grain and move it from the harbour at Ostia the 10 or so miles inland mm -hmm. to the city of Rome. Mm -hmm. And dramatic differences. Once a society has reached the level of development, it's able to exploit these, these advantages of the Mediterranean Sea. Dramatically changes the economics. And I found that this uh, tended to be the case with uh, the geographical drivers throughout the story, that they impacted in multiple ways as mm -hmm. people learned to exploit them. But of course, uh, only when you get to a certain level of development are you able to exploit these advantages. So, th so the first two have something to do in each case with what one might say is sort of biological fertility, resource endowment, and then a, a kind of big floodplain on, mm -hmm. on which you can grow a lot of stuff. Uh, and then when you sort of move along in the historical process, uh, it is then a way of kind of transferring resources, a better transportation system, yes. and, and the communication of ideas yeah, as well, perhaps. multiple regions together mm -hmm. so that, uh, say, again, with the Roman example, if you're in the city of Rome, you've got access to the, the grain that can be grown in Egypt and around the coast of the Black Sea, and you've got access to the, the olive oil that comes from Tunisia, and of course, as you're saying, access to the ideas, you've got access to the manpower, all of this provides, it basically it transforms the nature of the economic unit. And then with the Atlantic, these things get multiplied even yes, further. Yes, on a vastly bigger scale, yes. I think that is the real, the real break point in the, the modern part of the story, it's the point at which Europeans, in the 17th century really, uh, really begin to be able to bring together the economic complementarities of the different coasts around the North Atlantic. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're sort of looking further east, of course, the Chinese uh, develop a very sophisticated, somewhat later, but a very sophisticated civilization. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have uh, either the big inland sea or, or, or the great navigable ocean that they can easily mm -hmm. use. Uh, but you also have the Indian Ocean, uh, which is a kind of, might be considered a sort of Mediterranean writ large, I suppose. Yes. There's certainly yes. a lot of commerce for the last two millennia, maybe even more earlier than that, mm -hmm. in and around the Indian Ocean. Um, uh, so would you say up to that point, uh, the various civilizations of the world are on a fairly even keel? in terms of their development opportunities? Yeah, I think um, the, the western end of Eurasia gets uh, like a head start in this whole process because uh, when the world is warming up again to the Ice Age, um, the, the concentrations of plants and animals that can be domesticated are very unevenly distributed and the densest concentrations are in the, sort of the borderlands of Iran, what's now Iran, Iraq, Turkey, uh, Syria, Israel, Lebanon. Uh, and so this is the part of the world that gets started first down the agricultural path. So all the way down to, um, I would say down to the 6th century AD, the highest levels of development anywhere in the world are always at the western end of Eurasia, mm -hmm. and particularly around the shores of the East Mediterranean Sea, mm -hmm. and, uh, well basically you know, Italy to Iraq is mm -hmm. the sort of core area here. And, um, when we look back on these periods of modern times, um, the gap in development scores, and the, the index I developed to measure this, the, the gap in development scores between the big civilizations is always relatively small by modern standards because you know, you're dealing with just different levels of sophistication of agrarian civilizations. And so in India and China, 
you get great agrarian civilizations that, as you say, don't have an inland Mediterranean sea to master. Their development as a result of this, I would say, doesn't rise as high as you get in the Roman Empire. Until and China, again, is this fascinating, and for all purposes, fascinating comparison case. They're the big one to look at. One of the great things the Chinese do in the 7th century AD is, in a sense, to kind of make their own Mediterranean Sea, a man-made Mediterranean Sea, by digging the Grand Canal that allows you to tie together the, the two really big valleys, the, the Yangtze and Yellow River valleys. In a way, I mean, it's not, it's not the Mediterranean Sea, it's, a, it's just a, a figure of speech to call it the man-made Mediterranean Sea, but functionally this is sort of what it does on a smaller scale. And um, so that, this, of course, is the point at which Chinese development pulls ahead of Western. So the, the difference is relatively small from a modern perspective, but one of the striking things which again surprised me writing the book was that uh, over the 15,000 years since the end of the last ice age, Western development has been the highest in the world for 90% of the time. Now a lot of people would say, well, you're leaving something out. I mean, what about culture? Uh, don't human beings to a large degree create their own environment? Uh, as much perhaps as, or at least to a very substantial extent, as nature does, mm -hmm. and they live within that environment. And if one were to have visited, say, Europe around 1500 and China around 1500, you would have found rather different cultural mm -hmm. environments mm -hmm. in many respects. Uh, you would have found differences even in, in basic things like marriage patterns, uh, polygamy for the well-to-do, at least in China, versus more monogamy. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Western Europe, differences in religion and in governing institutions, etc., philosophic traditions. But but you don't think those things are crucial, and maybe you could tell us why. Yes, well, this is because this is one of the big issues that historians and social scientists uh, struggle with all the time. What is the balance between individual agency and free will, or you know, written on a slightly larger scale, cultural factors, accidents, great men, and so on? and um, the sort of vast impersonal forces of geography or economics or, or demography or whatever you choose to look at. And the, the, so the, the, the point that I ended up at by the time I finished writing the book is that um, geography, uh, as I keep saying throughout this book, geography is the big driver in this story. But it's not, uh, it's not a completely determining force. It's kind of a probabilistic thing. Let's say, uh, you know, um, going back to one of my favorite places, the end of the Ice Age, uh, when you look at the world at the end of the Ice Age, there are all these places where there are plants and animals that can be domesticated. And it was always possible that you would get some fluky, weird pattern where, uh, where say, you know, conceivably um, farming might have begun along the southern edge of the Sahara Desert in Africa, the Sahel. It was possible, but that's not how it turned out. And uh, I think the reason that's not what how it turned out, is that the odds were stacked so heavily against it. Anything, absolutely anything can happen, but on the whole, the most likely things are the ones that do happen. And so if you'd been you know, alien in a spaceship orbiting the Earth 10,000 years ago, you would have predicted that Southwest Asia is where the farming would start first, and that East Asia uh, would probably be the second place, and there are centers in other parts of the world where it will come along later. And that's pretty much how it turned out. And I think um, another of the things I learned writing the book is that the, the bigger the scale you are operating on, the longer the time frame, the more global the questions you're asking, the more important the vast impersonal forces and forces of probability are. And when you zero in, if you sort of zero in down to uh, the lifetime of an individual, say you're writing a biography, yeah, obviously the geography is important, so it makes a huge difference to your life whether you're born in, in New York City or whether you're born in the middle of Siberia. But a huge amount of the story of the individual level is going to be about the choices you make, the accidents that happen, the culture you're in. So, I, I mean, while I you know, keep saying to my mind that geography is the decisive thing, geography is what makes a difference between East and West, I do feel that depends entirely on what is the question you're asking. For the question I was asking, geography seemed to me to be decisive. For other questions, you'd want to emphasize something else, though. Uh, uh, how probable was it, taking these big factors into account, in, in your view, mm -hmm. how probable was it near a certainty uh, or something 
I know we're talking in necessarily crude terms, something yeah. a good deal less than that, yeah. uh, that the breakthrough into modern technological uh, society w would occur in the West. Was yes. it a certainty that it would occur here? Was there a, a kind of real race going on? Um, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me give you a classic historian's answer. It <laughs> depends. <laughs> it depends on where you imagine, what, what point in space and time you imagine yourself at when you ask that question. So if you imagine it's 1800 AD and we ask how likely is it that the West will come to dominate the world? Well, at that point, it's virtually a certainty. Um, you know, short of an asteroid hitting the Earth or something, I, I find it impossible to see what could have prevented um, the West. At this point, the Industrial Revolution is already underway. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's almost impossible to see how it could have turned out wildly differently uh, at, that, at that point. If you go back a little earlier, 1700, I think the forces are in place uh, by 1700 that make it almost certain that you're going to get uh, Western domination, economic, cultural domination of the globe uh, by that point. Um, although less certain than it'll be by 1800. Go back further still, go back to 1500, it's probable at that point. So the Europeans are mastering the Atlantic Ocean, drawing the Americas into their economy, it's probable. Uh, although if you were to say, well, it, how likely is it that by 1800 the British will have, specifically will have had an industrial revolution, that's much less certainly. It, it could easily have happened somewhere else in Western Europe. It could easily have taken 50 years longer. It could conceivably have happened a bit faster. So I think you know, the, the further back you go, uh, generally the broader the margins of error it gets. If you go back to the year 1000, then I would say it, the it's probable still that the West will be the part that has the, uh, the, the breakthrough, but at that point, uh, development is actually higher in China, so there's a so very why would you have bet on the West in the year 1000? Well, I think if you had had omniscience, you'd seen everything that could happen, you'd say, well, what actually happens in reality is the most probable outcome, which is that the Chinese over the next few hundred years are going to make all the really big important inventions in the world. They are going to invent um, ships that can reliably sail across the oceans. They are going to invent real working guns that can you know, shoot people. You can kill the people you meet on the other side of the ocean. This is probably all going to happen in China, possibly India, but probably China. But then once these things have been developed, become invented, because social development and, and contacts have reached the level they're now at, these things are going to, these ships and guns are going to diffuse very quickly. Uh, as it in fact happened, the gun, um, I was saying in my lecture yesterday, the gun diffuses across Eurasia faster than any invention has ever spread before in history. And once Europeans get the ships and the guns, geography means that they are much better placed to exploit them than people in East Asia. So even though they don't invent them, they are the ones who get to exploit these inventions because it's so much closer for them to get to the Americas than it is for East Asians to get to the Americas. And then there's other things that kind of multiply up, and there's some geographical luck as well. Uh, the Europeans have got good reasons to go sailing out once they get the ships. So Europe is, at this point, 1,500, um, a, rel uh, a thousand rather, a relatively poor part of uh, the, the world. There's pressures on Europeans to get to the rich parts, so they're going to get in their ships and head out into the Atlantic Ocean, try to sail around the bottom of Africa in a way that the Chinese say don't really have those pressures because they are the rich part of them. Where would they go? Why would they sail out into the Pacific? So, uh, and then if you went back even further, say to Roman times 2,000 years ago, and asked at that point, how's it going to go? Again, I think you would say it's probably going to be the West, although um, the, the distance that people have to travel from a Roman world to get to an industrial revolution is so enormous that in Roman times, I think you'd have to say, well, it's probably going to be the West, but the range of accidents that might disturb this pattern or might cause it to take many thousands of years, there's just a lot more still on the table. Would you have been able to say at that point, looking at the level of Roman development where Italy is the core region, mm -hmm. the most, most developed part, would you have been able to say with any confidence that it was going to occur in northwestern Europe as opposed to, say, the uh, um, Tigris and Euphrates Basin, uh, which, you know, not all that almost part of the empire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it yeah, because yeah, this, yeah, and uh, there's a, you know, a certain point at which it, even I start to think that the what if questions are <laughs> spiraling out of control. But yes, yeah, so, you know, if I had to make up a story uh, based on this, I'd say there's this wonderful episode of Star Trek called Bread and Circuses that aired in the late 1960s where the Starship Enterprise 
planet, and we show up another planet. It shows up this planet which is exactly like Earth, except that the Roman Empire never fell. And so like, the whole world has been conquered by the Romans at this point, and uh, they've had an industrial revolution and everything, but it's still like the Roman Empire. So say if something like that had really happened, the Roman Empire, although I think this is, was a very, very improbable outcome that this actually could have happened, but say the Roman Empire had survived right through the first millennium, into the second millennium, my guess would be that what would eventually have happened uh, is that um, the western provinces of the empire, so, you know, Britain down to Spain, they would be the place that would lead in the, the expansion of the seas, the exploration of things. And, uh, it, it's still being controlled from the city of Rome, but it'll be people from the western provinces of the empire that will sort of lead in this, again, just because of the simple geography. Even with the possibility that the, the uh, uh, Mesopotamian region would have had this big outlet to the Indian Ocean, and so plenty of chances to do exploration and freight. Yeah, too. I think, I, uh, yes, because that's something that goes back a very, very long way. We know now that Sargon of Akkad back in the 24th century BC is already trading with the Indus Valley, and um, in Roman times, Pliny tells us about these enormous uh, merchant fleets that would set out once a year to catch the monsoon winds and take them straight to India. Uh, and then they wait there six months to the monsoon reverses. They just bring them straight back home again. Perfect mechanism. And uh, for a long time, historians actually dismiss the numbers Pliny gives us and the scale of the Roman Indian trade. But the archaeology and a few papyrus finds have shown us now that if anything, he's actually understating the volume of this trade. Enormous. But I think the big difference is um, the Atlantic Ocean, uh, and just, just by the luck of the draw, the Atlantic has this gigantic advantage over the Indian Ocean in terms of the, the sheer variety of ecologies and societies you find around its shores. So um, in some ways the big engine of the European takeoff in the 18th century is this triangular trade that develops in the Atlantic where you've got manufactured goods. If you're a merchant in Liverpool, get manufactured goods in Liverpool, guns and blankets and whatever, then you can sail down to West Africa, um, exchange your manufactured goods for human beings, for slaves, sail and make a profit on that. Sail across to the Caribbean uh, and exchange the slaves um, for the goods the slaves are producing there, like rum and sugar, take that back to England, sell it for another enormous profit, get more manufactured goods, and go on whipping around. The ships are now good enough to, to do this. Um, the, the societies are varied enough to produce all these different goods that uh, people at different points want. The Indian Ocean is a fantastic trading basin, but it doesn't quite have that. I mean, that, the, the, the peculiarities of the Atlantic is what make it such a motor. And again, you know, if it was sort of making up hypothetical futures, my guess would be that if somehow, if the Americas had sort of sunk beneath the waves, so you, there's no possibility of this Atlantic economy, that eventually an Indian Ocean economy, or perhaps a sort of Southeast Asian economy, will drive societies to the point that an industrial revolution is able to happen. That it, we, we would have got there in the end. But the, the peculiarities of the actual geography we've got made it so that it was, I think, well, as I was saying, always more likely that it, um, it was going to be Western Europe. Now, you yeah. think the impact of the Atlantic trade was more than just uh, a more diverse economic division of labor and a certain amount of additional, important amount of additional wealth production. You think it was intellectual as well. Yes. Maybe you can yes. explain that. Yes, so, and then another of the really interesting things that um, historians have discovered over the last few years is this old argument goes back 60, 70 years that um, capitalism in Europe was basically built on uh, a Marxist argument, built on the basis of surplus labor extracted from Africans. That Europeans get rich by using African labor to extract American resources, was the argument. And um, people have now been able to quantify uh, the, the different inputs in the Atlantic economy and using some fairly sophisticated econometrics, come up with quite good estimates of just how much of the gains uh, to the Europeans are generated by the fact that they're shipping Africans to the Americas. And it's not a trivial amount, but it's not the whole story either. It's somewhere around 10% can be accounted for directly by exploitation of African labor. The rest of the gains are provided by Europeans figuring out how to, how to really use and exploit this new kind of economy. And uh, of course, one of the things that you famously see in Europe across the 17th and 18th centuries is this dramatic expansion of markets, uh, market techniques and uh, methods. 
and people moving into market exchange in an enormous way. And uh, this, as I see it, is driven very much by the fact that um, there's this desperate hunger for manufactured goods, which uh, for a trader starting in England, this is the, the start of the triangle trade, is the manufactured goods. And they're willing to offer wages, which, uh, of course, by our standards, is like slave labor wages, terrible wages. The industrial workers in England are often living in appalling conditions. But from the perspective of the workers, this is a whole lot better than staying on the farm and starving. Um, they, they begin to create this much more complex market-driven division of labour in Europe. The, the world has seen slightly similar things before, but never on this scale. So the Europeans begin to restructure their societies in the 17th and especially 18th centuries. And of course, not surprisingly, as they do this, they start saying, well, what the heck is going on here? How can we make sense of this world that we're creating? And um, the, the Atlantic economy, I think, has driven Europeans to start looking at the world in an entirely different way. And part of this is driven by uh, their needs to, a new need to understand the natural environment and the realization that if we understand how the winds and the tides work and how the stars move, um, the payoffs in the, the mercantile realm are going to be enormous. And a lot of the early thinkers about these problems were people who were heavily involved in, in uh, Atlantic trade as well. And that, I think, is what pushes Europeans to start asking new questions about the natural world. And so the Europeans who figure out natural science and what we would now call modern natural sciences, Europeans do this in the 17th century not because they're cleverer than the Chinese or um, because of their cultural traditions or anything like this, but because the questions are so much more urgent and pressing for them. And the scientific techniques they develop in the 18th century, they start applying these back on their own societies in what we normally call the Enlightenment. And starting thinking about, well, does it really make sense to think that God has put these kings over us with a, a church to support them and that the kings should be telling everybody what to do? Does that really make sense? And of course, Europeans start saying, well, no, it doesn't really make sense. And you get plenty of people in other parts of the world who are also say this doesn't really make sense, but nowhere with the sort of systematic rigor of thinking that you're getting in Europe. And it's until it gets to the point, of course, where you're getting rulers, particularly in Northwest Europe, where the process goes furthest, you're getting rulers are starting to say, like uh, Frederick the Great in Prussia, saying, well, yeah, I, know, I, really, I ought to be an enlightened monarch. That's actually a very sensible thing. And I'll have to give up some things, but what I get in return is so much better. So yes, I, I think the, the geography, sort of, the, the forces of geography kind of play out all the way up the scale, e even into the intellectual developments. Uh, you know, your, your view is really a profoundly optimistic one. I think so. <laughs> uh, which distinguishes it from a lot of takes on mankind and, mm -hmm. and mankind's prospects nowadays. Uh, you believe that there is a kind of underlying motor uh, that is pushing uh, technological and cultural advance mm -hmm. um, and it has been playing out these past 15,000 years or so, and you can see the trend lines that evidence this really in, in almost in, in almost every part of the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, why do you think that's that's happening, and where is this, the story is not over, as you tell us, where is this likely to go? Yeah. Well, I think, um, I, in my book, I, I put this great emphasis on geography. I think geography has been the most important force in deciding why uh, you know, one particular part of the world has developed so much faster than other parts of the world. But the real bottom line, I would say, is actually not the geography, but the biology, the, 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 the human animal. Um, that you know, we are animals like all the other animals. What we, uh, what we want, what we need, is not so different from any other animals. And we're driven by the same forces. We have to extract energy from the world, otherwise you know, our body will gradually shut down and we'll die. Um, if we don't extract more energy than we need just to, to keep ourselves going, we won't be able to reproduce, so we'll die out. We have to extract more energy still to, to live a comfortable life. And we're driven by the same basic imperatives as any other animal. Um, and in that way, uh, one of the things I like to say to annoy my colleagues is that history is simply a subfield of biology. It's a study of what one particular species of animals does. Um, but, of course, we are a very special species of animals. And w what I would say, the real difference between the humans and the other animals is the big brains that we've got, uh, which allow us to, to look at the world and to you know, figure out what we want from the world and figure out ways to get it, figure out new ways to get it, uh, which animals 
with trivial exceptions. Other species of animals can't do that. They have a way of acting in the world. They, they can't consciously change that very much at all. Humans can do this, can, can change the way they act. And the result of that is that um, we, we share with all the other animals biological evolution. I mean, gradually, through random processes of mutation, uh, our physical bodies change uh, in ways that to fit in better with the world and allow us to, to, to sort of flourish uh, in the world. But we also have cultural evolution. No other animals do this. And so, at the end of the Ice Age, the world warms up, there's more food available for m many, many species. Most species, uh, they eat the extra food, their numbers expand until they outrun the, the food supply, and then they have a, a population crash, go back into equilibrium with the food supply. Humans follow the same path, but as they outrun the food supply, they're able to recognize what's happening and start doing things about it. Well, they don't always succeed, but they're able to start trying to do things about it. And that's what makes us different from the other animals. And so far, at least, it's turned out that we have... You know, with many, many missteps along the way. We have managed to figure out and innovate to new ways of doing things that you know, keep us extracting more energy, multiplying to ever greater numbers with seven billion of us, living at higher and higher standards of living. Um, and although it doesn't feel like it a lot of the time, but more and more leisure time available to us. These extraordinary changes. And I think these are, are likely to continue. I don't think we've reached the end of this story yet. And um, the story of anything, the, the story of change is, is, the speed is multiplying and increasing. The change is happening faster and faster this, because there's so many more of us and the changes that we make kind of feed back on each other. And, and, and the, the, the large, um, what we really see here over, over the course of time is increasing mastery of the environment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, if, if that's true, and of course in the last 200 years this this mastery with all sorts of unintended side effects to be sure that create problems, but this mastery uh, of, of the environment has reached sort of unprecedented proportions. Does that kind of uh, begin to reduce then the primacy of geography? Does geography matter as much today as mm -hmm. it did in the past? And will it continue to matter very much at all uh, in the longer term? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it seems to me that the, the story is pretty clear. Geography has uh, it's, it's been its importance has constantly been changing through history, and in some ways you can say that its importance has been declining, particularly in the last two hundred years. Um, the, one of the big stories going on throughout human history has been globalization, which is now we have just exploded in speed over the last few years. And um, one of the effects of the globalization is that we can move. Uh, ideas around now you know, pretty much instantaneously around the world. We can move people around at a rate unimaginable even a century ago. We can move goods around on this enormous scale. We can change the world to fit in with what we want. And of course geography has not gone away. Uh, if you're born in, in the Congo or if you're born in Shanghai or if you're born on you know, a, a reservation in North Dakota, these things make enormous differences to how your life is going to turn out. But not as enormous as they were a thousand years ago. And I would suspect that a hundred years from now, uh, geography and space is going to matter very, very little in the world. And, and that, I think that's not a particularly controversial thing to say. I think most people would agree that this is happening. How far you think it'll go, a lot of them talk about So if we are able answer. to terraform Mars, that would be the ultimate triumph of technological culture over environment. Well, I, when I started writing my book, I was sort of thinking, well, yes, of course, this is where it's going. I mean, the scale gets bigger and bigger, the world more and more tied together. The obvious outcome is Starship Enterprise again, yeah. the, 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 the universe more and more drawn together. Um, but as, the more I looked into this, the more the reading I did, <coughs> I began to understand the sheer scale of the spaces we're talking about that unless there's something very fundamental that we still don't understand about physics, which is you know, perfectly possible, um, the distances involved are so big that uh, physically moving human beings to other planets, especially outside the solar system, it's just, it's just not ever going to be a very successful thing. But, but, but you also wonder whether the species is going mm, to remain, yes, whether yes. we're not on the verge of a new speciation. Exactly, yeah. I, mean, I think it's relatively uncontroversial to say that geography is changing its meanings and maybe losing its meanings. So biology might biology, be as well. Biology, yeah. Biology, I think, is the, the real game changer here. 
as um, you know, our biology, we have changed um, biologically as animals over the last 50,000, 100,000 years, but not all that much. I mean, if you ran into a modern human of 50,000 years ago on, uh, on the street out in Lubbock, you would not be that surprised by what you met. You'd be able to talk to them, all kinds of stuff. Uh, the, the animal hasn't changed all that much. But in the last 100 years, it really ha the, the human animal really has begun changing. And a lot of this has been driven so far uh, just by all the energy we're able to capture, the food we're now able to put into our bodies, so that we all grow up, uh, obviously we vary, but big and strong and healthy by the standards of any earlier age. Um, public health programs, so lots and lots of diseases have been more or less eradicated. But we're now, of course, reaching a point where we can intervene in our own body scientifically in a way that was simply unimaginable. And um, I was at a, a talk at Stanford just a few days ago, <coughs> where they, <coughs> excuse me, one of the things they were talking about was um, nanobots, uh, molecular scale robots, uh, to be injected into the bloodstream to fight cancer. And these are these are computers a few molecules long. They can identify cancerous red blood cells and attach themselves to them, change the genetic structure of those cells so they stop reproducing. And this is not science fiction. This has actually been a commercially available medical procedure for more than a decade now. And this stuff, we are just scratching the surface. And there's a lot of different strands um, going on. One is uh, genetic uh, molecular scale alteration of the human body. Um, drugs, pharmacology is another big one. I mean, we can control our moods, the ways our brains work in ways which, again, would have been magic a hundred years ago. Um, fusion of animals with, with technology, carbon-based complex structures with silicon-based ones. This is something that, again, we're in the infancy of this, um, but uh, it's going to keep moving over the next century. Uh, very, very rapidly. And um, my guess is that what is happening here is, in fact, the latest version of the kind of evolution that's driven the entire story of life. And you think, where did we come from, modern humans? We came from um, predecessor species of humans which were very different from us. And they made us through biological evolution by random mutations in their genetic structures that end up leading to us without them knowing this was going to happen. And once this happened, the species that produced us became obsolete, basically. I mean, a harsh way to put it, but that is what happened. They, they, went, they go extinct. We replaced them. I would guess that this is what's happening now on the technological side, that we are creating what will ultimately replace us evolutionarily. Whether it's through some kind of fusion of the human animal and the, the, the forms of intelligence we're able to create through tinkering with bits of silica now rather than just through having sex. Um, or whether it's that um, biological carbon-based animals, this is just one step in the story and there's the world is moving on to an entirely different form of you, you find this transhumanist uh, perspective exhilarating or uh, sad, uh, depressing? Well, I think it's like being, it's like being an evolutionist, uh, in fact. I think that you're asking, is this a good thing or a bad thing? That's sort of beside the point. Is it a good thing or a bad thing that human beings outbred Neanderthals and make them go extinct? It's a bad thing if you're a Neanderthal, a good thing if you're human. And I think, I, I guess I would see um, when I think it raises a public policy way. question or a whole series of public policy questions, but you're sort of suggesting you think it's inevitable. I think it's inevitable in the same way that earlier evolution machines have been inevitable. That um, you, we could all decide, of course some people do decide, uh, this is horrible, I want no part of it, I want you know, nothing to do with, uh, uh, with, let's say, stem cells, I'm going to ban this and not allow it to happen. That doesn't work, I mean, as we found. It. One group of people decides they're going to turn away from the technological advances and changes. Other groups are not going to decide that. You can try to force them to do the same thing as you. Um, the story so far has always been that over the long run, that doesn't work. And uh, I suspect that that's going to continue to be the case in the future. So, I mean, I think I'm, yeah, I'm an optimist about the story, but I think I'm an optimist in a rather peculiar sense. Um, and I think that uh, the development It's going to take us to a world that um, we might not, not like very much, and in fact we might find it absolutely repulsive. Exactly, I mean, just as Neanderthals would have found the world that got created by modern humans just utterly alien, incomprehensible, kind of repulsive to them, uh, this is the way the story plays out. So you, you project trend lines for the future of East and West, and you um, think that somewhere in the middle of the 
22nd century. Uh, the lines cross, given current rates of growth in, in the East. But, but if you, based on what you just said, kind of if you step back, uh, the West rules humanity for now, but in all likelihood, if what you said is true, by the 22nd century, A, there'll be no West, properly speaking, yes. and B, there may well be no humanity, properly speaking. Um, uh, so, uh, so, you, so, you, so, so your real view, if you put all this together, <laughs> is that the West is the cap of human history, out of which something else emerges. Yeah, well, I think we, we, we've been cursed to live in interesting times. And of course, we're living in a world now where um, the US is by far and away the most powerful nation in the world, the richest nation in the world, the strongest nation in the world. There's never been a dominance like this. But we are also very clearly living in a world where um, the balance is tipping toward East Asia, and the new great rivals of the United States are, are growing up in East Asia. And if previous history is a guide, look back at the way things have gone before, what we should expect to happen, I would say, um, would be not wildly different from what happens to the British in the late 19th century. The British create this global system, which they dominate much less than the US now dominates, but they do dominate it. But part of the global system is that the British are sort of forced by um, industrial, uh, capitalist in industry to help other nations develop, so these nations can become wealthy by British goods. The British end up creating their own rivals in Germany and the United States, and ultimately these rivals displace them in the top of the pile. The US, of course, has played this major part in creating Japan and China as these huge economies, with major benefits from the United States, but it did still create its own rivals. And so I would suspect if things played out the same again, we would see the US in the course, I would say in the mid to late 20th century, begin to get pushed up the top of the pile by the rivals that it has itself created. While still, America still continues to get richer and uh, sort of a happier place to live and so yeah, but, 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 but all, all the transformation of the basic categories, humanity no longer being humanity, uh, the world sort of flowing together. Is it, is it still reasonable to talk in the 22nd century about the United States passing the baton to something else? Well, this, this is, I think, what makes it, why I, I keep saying that if, if it played out like it has before, if the in the past is a good guide to the future. Uh, because uh, clearly, uh, from what I've already been saying, I think that there is a great discontinuity. And we're standing uh, at a break point. Here. Yes, exactly. We have the uh, changes of a kind that modern humanity has, has never had to confront before. And what I, the, the big thing I find to worry about for the 21st century is that the pattern of the past has always been that these major shifts in wealth and power around the world have been accompanied by massive violence because your violence is one of the tools that humans have at their disposal to resolve disputes. It's always been used in the past. Um, because the, the Second World War, terrible thing, kills, depending on how you count, 50 to 100 million people. If we were to have a Third World War of an equivalent type over really over domination of the entire planet now, we have the potential to annihilate humanity altogether. Which, of course, leads you to a very different future. I mean, once again, there's a break in the story, but a break of a really very different kind now. We well, the great experiments of high intelligence fed. The cockroaches inherit the Earth. We, we restart the whole thing. <laughs> we, we come back in, in a few hundred million years and we have this conversation again. So I, I think that the great, uh, the great fear for the 21st century is that we do rerun the historical pattern. Um, I'm fairly optimistic that we won't rerun the historical um, and I'm writing a book about this right now, about the history of war. But the, the main reason I have sort of guarded optimism that we will sort of manage the international system, that the United States will not be pushed into places where, where war becomes the, well, it starts to seem like a realistic, sensible option, is that if you look back at, at the Cold War, and if we'd been having this conversation 50 years ago, right after the Cuban Missile Crisis, right after the, the Berlin Crisis, and I'd said to you, you know, Steve, one day, a few years from now, one day, those commies, they're all going to wake up one day and they're going to look around and say, you know, this communism thing, it's not working for me anymore. It's not doing it anymore. Let's stop it. Let's, let's tear down the Berlin Wall. Let's sort of become friends with the West. About 300 people are going to get shot, mostly in Romania. And that's it. There's going to be no nuclear war, no third world war. It'll be a sort of global capitalist order. You would have thought I was mad if I 
had said that in 1963. That was just seems so implausible. So few people were saying that. And yet, of course, that is roughly how things turned out. And I think that the cultural evolution um, allows us to respond to the environment we live in and change our values, our institutions, to reflect the realities that we live in. We were able to do that in the 1960s. I am guardedly optimistic we'll be able to do that in the 2020s, 2030s, 2040s. I think the world is becoming a much more dangerous place to live in. It's going to be more dangerous in the 21st century than it's ever been before. But I think we will be able to master this risk because we will succeed in changing our institutions so that they're able to deal with global problems. And ultimately you think it's sort of the manifest advantages of living in a kind of prosperous, exchange-based, rational, humanitarian order that will be palpably clear to enough people. Uh, so when they come to these moments of choice uh, between doing something destructive and something constructive, mm. they'll choose, you think, they'll choose the constructive road. Um, I, I would like to believe so, at least up to a point. I mean, I, do think that people will be capable of stepping back from the brink of the, the really extreme outcomes. I would not be in the least bit surprised if we do see nuclear wars in the next 20 or 30 years. I, mean, I, I would be quite surprised if we don't see a nuclear war in South or Southwest Asia over the next 20 or 30 years. Um, because the people, the people in charge there are dealing with different constraints and threats than, say, the, the leaders of the US or Soviet Union during the Cold War. They're not talking about total annihilation of the world. The nuclear arsenals are smaller. Um, I, I will be very pleasantly surprised if they manage to avoid using nuclear weapons. Well, thank you very much. I'll, <laughs> I'll leave it to our viewers to decide uh, whether the notion of the uh, abolition of man through technological change versus the notion of the abolition of man through nuclear holocaust uh, are, are whether, whether, which one the, 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 yes. the, the former is, uh, is, is something to be, uh, to, be, to be cherished and look forward to. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's been a very stimulating discussion and, and thank you so much for spending your time with us. Well, thanks so much for having me here.